Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the uh, chance to participate in this interesting and wide-ranging debate. And uh, particularly to think about uh, the kind of systems or socio-technical systems which have organized, reorganized, remade lives and remade cities, uh, particularly over the last uh, century or so. Um, it's worth remembering the first car to go over 60 miles an hour was an electric car in uh, Paris in 1899 and uh, subsequent uh, developments of electric battery powered vehicles were relatively common with even Ford uh, making battery driven cars in the early years of the 20th century. But in a kind of way the interesting question for me about electric cities is that the, form, the predominant forms of transportation have not been electric. They have been based upon a very significant discovery, the discovery of oil gushing out of the ground. This was the first oil gusher in 1901 in Texas. And in a way that made a peculiar pattern in which although there was <coughs> in a kind of way an electric society coming to be formed, uh, certainly during the interwar period beginning in the States, the forms of transportation have remained resolutely oil-based. And uh, my question really is, could it be the case that a new socio-technical system, which is post-oil, uh, an electric system in some way or another, might come to be uh, formed, and what would be the conditions under which that might uh, happen to occur? And of course, it's uh, interesting to think about the car system. Uh, of course, the car system is never just a car. It adapts, it spreads along the roads and paths of each city, draws in many aspects of its environment. It's utterly central to almost all the leading industrial sectors and leading firms of the 20th century. It promotes notions of convenience, it seemingly provides solutions to the problems of congestion, which in a kind of way it itself generates. It externalizes danger and is central to a sort of individualistic freedom to drive, freedom to consume uh, culture of contemporary capitalism. So this was an extraordinarily powerful socio-technical system that kind of spread through the world and has kind of remade pretty well every city. Uh, that uh, we have come to know and has produced, uh, similar to a pic another picture this morning, a pattern of being locked into oil. And it's worth noting that 95% of transportation energy, at least 95%, is oil-based, providing the power to move cars, lorries, planes, sh ships, and many trains. And this is a powerful... Uh, system. But of course it has, as we know, uh, in various ways, lots of problems. One of the problems is, uh, this is for the United States, the declining ratio between the use of oil and uh, the uh, supply of oil, an increasing uh, gap between the two over a relatively short period. Uh, <coughs> a pattern of uh, contributing to uh, global carbon emissions. And I think this uh, figure is particularly striking because of the uh, upward shift from 1950. If only we could turn the clock back, I know there's a small problem of changing population to 1950, uh, then, uh, and many, some of us in this room vaguely remember 1950, actually that's an interesting pattern and there may be lessons from indeed wartime experiences as to how lives might, have, might be better lived. <clears throat> and then also the, relation, the more general global uh, supply of oil at the time of astonishing increases in likely demand as we've been hearing this morning uh, across the developing world and especially within uh, China. That gap between the two is very striking. And if you see from that 1960s, interesting decade, was the peak discovery period for oil. 
and there's been a kind of increasing gap between the two. We also heard in one of the talks this morning about the role, role of oil shortages and price increases in the financial collapse uh, in 2007 8 So how, what's, what's, what, should be, what, what is to be done, we might ask? And I want, first of all, to say just a little bit about uh, the systems that are in place here. And these are systems which are never just technical or technological. Uh, and they also are important because of the way in which they generate lock-ins over decades. Uh, I like the notion that things ha systems have a kind of momentum. And the systems significant in the contemporary world are never economic or physical or technological or social or political. They are all of those. And they kind of they fit together. They combine together. They generate momentum and patterns of uh, path dependence and uh, lock-in, as also we heard uh, this morning. And thus we should uh, resist an analysis of change which looks at technology, as though technologies in and of themselves will come along, will generate themselves autonomously and remake uh, the social or physical or economic worlds. Uh, they are heavily embedded in uh, forms of economic, social, and political life. I like to describe this as, therefore, new technologies require both a business model but also a societal or sociological model of the kinds of uses to which any such new technology might be put. There's obviously much unpredictability, non-linear kinds of relations between uh, systems and their patterns of development. And then when we're trying to think about innovation, innovation must be and is hugely uh, sort of made up of many different components and elements, some of which we're going to hear more about in the uh, discussion in, in a minute. Uh, and I quite like the idea of thinking about the ways in which one can effect uh, synchronization through uh, and across many different social, economic, and political organizational entities. Uh, a bit uh, taking up the, the book by Steve Strogratz on sync, the, the role of synchronizing a system uh, in a kind of unplanned but not uncoordinated uh, way. <coughs> and also when we think of systems, we have to think of the relationship, of course, not just well, we have to think of the relationship to existing systems. I very much like this quote from uh, Buckminster Fuller, the futurist writer, who says, you never change anything by fighting the existing reality. What you have to do is to build a new model, you know, uh, mobile phones, as, and that will over time, or may over time, make existing model of landline phones uh, obsolete. It's the new model building. And of course, as you're trying to build that new model, there are many difficulties and problems, particularly the power of interest invested in the existing model. <coughs> and another quote from the complexity economist Brian Arthur. So a revolution, a new socio-technical system, he says, does not arrive until we reorganize our activities, our uses, the, the purposes to which it's put around its technologies, and then the technologies themselves kind of reacting and responding to us, as he puts it. For this to happen, the new domain must gain uh, adherence and prestige. It must find purposes and uses, and that takes decades. And that's one of the massive problems in many discussions about uh, low carbon systems is, of course, they take decades, not years. And during the time, the old technology, we might say, lives on driving out uh, the new and making the new model so difficult to bring into being. Um, <coughs> so I then tr have tried in a couple of uh, books uh, to articulate what might constitute what I call a post-car uh, socio-technical system. Obviously, I've just listed uh, some of the characteristics. And the main point, I suppose, of these characteristics is that they, there are many of them. They're not led by the new kind of materials for building uh, vehicles or the type of engine drive or the type of charging system. 
but probably it's probably such a new system entails all of those things all of those things being developed in different places and there being this kind of process of synchronization of those processes around the world and across multiple cities and so on and so forth. <coughs> and in such a postcard system, uh, there's some of it is involves new kinds of movement and so on. But the most important thing, I think, is the idea that there are digital forms of uh, communication and information which enable one to assess whether or not physically moving is desirable or good. Too much of the literature on transport focuses to on transport and doesn't take sufficient account of the kinds of ways in which uh, there may be alternatives, substitutes, there may be different ways of organizing people's lives. <coughs> uh, and these are some more characteristics which I'll move on. Uh, in a report that I was part of, uh, one of the things that we tried to argue in relationship to electric vehicles was the utter importance not of adding in electric vehicles, but of uh, how is it that a kind of system uh, substitution might come to be realized. Uh, there are some interesting cracks in the uh, current system, what I call the steel and petroleum car system, and uh, they're nicely uh, indicated in that uh, book, edited book, uh, some of which will be, we've already been discussing. And this, I think, is striking the, the plateauing, at least, of car travel in a number of major Western countries. Uh, that actually starts in the US sort of before the economic uh, collapse of 2007-8. And people in the sort of transport field now are talking quite extensively about the idea of peak travel. Uh, and some data for the UK shows again a uh, declining number of trips per person, declining distance traveled. And in particular, I think, is the striking decline in the proportion of young people who now have an, a driving license. That figure had been going up year, year on year and it has now stopped going up and it has stopped going up again in many of the uh, major Western countries. So what I've done is in a very brief, I now have the red light, the red card. Uh, so uh, if this kind of postcast system does not uh, develop, then there are some other alternatives, one of which is a sort of a kind of Schumacher uh, local sustainability future with the localizing of friendship, work, education and so on. A second alternative which I have talked about is what I rather dramatically call uh, regional warlordism and the breakdown of many of the uh, possible uh, functions and systems which have organized and organized contemporary forms of contemporary life and if the postcard does not materialize, we might either have local sustainability or regional warlordism, as in Mad Max 2. <laughs>